Maybe I was silent for too long. So, uh, but thanks for everyone for coming back. Um, free food is great. Free food is best thing in the world. It has zero calories and, um, of course, costs you nothing, which is great. Anyway, so while the slides are still uploading, uh, let's look at the results uh, of of uh, of, the, of you guys voting. So you can still cast your vote, your change your vote, and it's uh, certainly very welcome. Um, but um, so basically, we have a couple of voting rules. If you just look at the plurality rule, let's just let me just quickly summarize. Not really summarizing, but uh, make some observations. You can make the decision uh, by yourself, and you can always uh, access this web page. Um, it's always online. Otherwise, uh, uh, probably the server is down. Which happens a couple of years, right? So you know, whenever you you have a great event, you want to show some live system, it's always down. Um, but uh, it actually happens once, but unfortunately not this time. So if you just look at um, plurality, everyone's uh, top choice matters, then we can see that uh, just among the audience, which might be different from the audience current here, you can see the large scale machine learning, uh, reinforcement learning, deep learning, are pretty popular ones. Uh, computer vision is next, and the rest of the things are. I know I voted for uh, hybrid game theory, but rest of things are not so much. Uh, by the way, so if you feel please uh, read that, that, that paper. That, that paper is pretty nice, uh, the 100 year study of last century politics. So um, not being not popular doesn't mean bad thing, right? So there must be reason behind it. Uh, this is one of the 11 areas. So maybe that means chance, right? So everyone's working on deep learning. Um, should I also uh, work on deep learning? Maybe yes, maybe no. But uh, of course, that's, that's your choice. But of course, we have other voting rules, which I'm not going to explain, but just tell you that uh, when we want to make a decision, when everyone has different preferences, there's a whole world of mechanisms beyond just simple plurality. Uh, you can click on these links to see the definitions of them, but pretty much different voting rules give you different winners. For example, uh, for border, reinforcement learning is, is best board border. It's kind of a smooth voting rule. Well, your top ranked candidates, sorry, your top ranked tiers got uh, many points, and then your second tier got uh, one reduction in the points, and so on. So it's a smooth voting system. Again, whether or not re this reveals the ground truth, that's a theoretical question, and that can be verified in maybe 20 years, um, but here is just an interesting experiment. What I really want to show is not the output of the result, but more like the output of the mixture models, which are also implemented using our algorithms. Well, I have no uh, time to talk about today, later on, but uh, just to give you an um, uh, example of mixture models, how it works. So just remember that uh, this is a mixture of two practice models. We have, uh, you can certainly load it for one, two, three. We can have implemented more, but it's just hard to show uh, five. Um, so uh, the way to read this model, it might be slightly hard to read. Let me see if I can change the color. Previously, when I click it, it changes the color, but it looks like this feature has been disabled. Uh, but anyway, so, um, so if we're gonna, let's say, if we're gonna just load k equals to one, let's use the Plaquitus model to fit everyone's preferences. No, everyone is not, not everyone is a metaphor ranking, but we have some ways to deal with partial rankings. Uh, anyway, so um, if, you, if you use a Plaquitus to fit it, um, and the width, remember that width represents um, kind of the popularity of the, 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 um, the each candidate, and looks like, I mean, you reach a similar, conclusion as if you're observing plurality or border that which is large scale machine learning very popular reinforcement learning popular deep learning computer vision so these are the popular ones but things becomes more interesting uh, when you actually look at the mixture models so look like like how many people belongs to each cluster that might be more interesting so let's say uh, at least our algorithm identifies two clusters Class one, I mean, almost half, half size. Let's do experiments, so please think about whomever voted, think about which, it doesn't matter. If, if you haven't voted, you can still think about which class best describes you. If you don't think you belong to any of this class, don't raise your hand, let's see how well the machine learning algorithm works. Um, it can be terrible, so, so feel free to screw me up. Uh, because, I mean, you, you know, this, this, is, this is just a small data set and many things can be wrong, but anyway, so uh, we have about equal size and the first group um, thinks strongly prefer reinforcement learning pretty much over, uh, over anything else. Basically just saying, reinforcement learning is winning pretty much any other thing by a large margin. This is the first group. The second group says that deep learning uh, and large scale machine learning dominates everyone else. And deep learning is more dominating 
um, but large-scale machine learning is reasonably fine. So it's actually pretty interesting to see that these two groups doesn't overlap. So according to machine learning, each of you have voted either belongs to a um, believer of reinforcement learning or a believer of deep learning plus somewhat kind of large-scale machine learning. So I know reinforcement learning is part of machine learning. You can say it's part of large-scale machine learning, but let's just, I mean, try to do this experiment. So whomever voted, or oh, actually, again, sorry, it doesn't matter. So please um, help me to clarify yourself, classify yourself as one of the following two classes. If you strongly believe that you are not in one of these classes, um, you don't need to raise up a hand. Class one, which I'm going to ask pretty soon, which is reinforcement learning pretty much deep, uh, dominating pretty much everything else. Class two, um, deep learning and large-scale machine learning um, dominating everything else. So now, so let's do experiments for class one. Um, who believe that reinforcement learning is kind of, of more dominating? Please raise up your hand. Let's, let's quickly count. Uh, it, it's not just uh, one, two, three, four. Okay, so uh, thank you guys, we have four. Uh, for the second class, who believe that deep learning and um, machine, large scale machine learning do dominates everything else? Oh, wow. Okay, so the <laughs> algor either the algorithm is wrong, or uh, some of you are just too shy, just like maybe some of the Trump supporters, you don't want to, you don't dare to say <laughs> reinforcement learning. Because, I mean, we all know that deep learning is, is dominating, which is um, true, but again, uh, but at least, um, whom, whom of you are, don't, don't think you are, you are any of this class? I'm actually not, by the way. Okay, so a couple of you. Well, so uh, at least our algorithm was not the very successful, but at least there were two. Um, I'm just presenting this fact so you can think about if uh, that's useful or not. Um, but at least we're going to draw this conclusion, right? So um, reinforcement learning is kind of separate from deep learning and uh, large-scale machine learning. By the way, I didn't cheat, right? So I never know what is this topic, so this everything is just down by. Uh, so if you set k equal to 3, use three clusters, you see that you pretty much reach, reach uh, the, the same uh, kind of uh, kind of the, the story, except that you have another part which is uh, ten percent. It doesn't really matter too much. So usually, I would say k equals two is the most sensible. K equals three, you got strange results. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, and by the way, so um, it's it's this this membership is also calculated by kind of partial membership. It's not like one belongs to one way or another. You can say I'm thirty percent of deep uh, reinforcement learning supporter. 70% of deep learning supporter, then your kind of 30% of, uh, of self is counted towards uh, reinforcement learning. So maybe that's also one of the reasons. So just asking which one do you more prefer is probably the right question. But anyway, so you see that what I'm trying to do, right? I'm trying to justify this algorithm. That's all I'm trying to do. But uh, certainly you're very welcome to make any um, um, argument about it. Uh, I think the slides are up online, so let me upload a final thing, put and then I will see if, um, if it's really up or not. <coughs> Same slow. So slowly uploading. I don't know what can I do, but um, probably let's 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 move on and come back and check it in a few minutes. Um, or maybe I should cancel and uh, let me uh, upload it again. We really need to rush. Yeah, anyway, so uh, if the slide is not uploaded, it, okay, so if, let me see. Ah, I see, I have to close. Um, uh, file actively incomplete, it's not transferred. Let me give it the last try by reconnecting my school's VPN, and if that fails, we have to move on. Sorry about that. Even 
this part is extremely slow. Okay, so let's move on. But certainly everything I will be uh, up online after today because I want to make sure that uh, the slides are correct and probably we'll skip some of the slides just because we probably won't have enough time for uh, reasoning. So. Uh, okay, so let me quickly talk about um, Okay, so uh, before we, we before the coffee break, we are talking about uh, maximum likelihood estimator and the Bayesian approach to uh, as general principles of decision making mechanisms um, under uh, statistic models. Now, uh, let me be more specific and move on to really interesting and some are recent, some are not so recent research on computing MLE and Bayesian for the rank models we have talked about. Okay, so um, what about ma computing the maximum likelihood estimator for MALOS? What is MALOS? Remember, MALOS is a model where the ground truth and, and the sample space are four rankings, and um, the probability of generating a ranking is, is well, it's five raised proportional to the five raised to the distance between the ground truth ranking and the data. So the further the, the, uh, the data is away, the, the further the ranking is away, the lower the probability of generating it. So um, basically, this is a classical uh, integer linear programming thing. Um, so, um, but uh, this is first known to be NP hard uh, in uh, 1989. Actually, this is uh, one of these papers, one where it's considered one of the starting point of uh, my own field, computation search of choice, which was actually 0.5, uh, uh, half of the, the direction listed in that 11 directions. The other half is algorithm, algorithm game theory, if you have paid attention. But anyway, so this is a hard problem. And it turns out to be very closely related to the feedback offset. So many um, theoretical computer scientists also paid attention to it. But we'll be talking about a practical way, uh, which becomes one of the standard ways, the baseline, which is using integer linear programming, a uh, pretty interesting LP, uh, to compute the Kamini ranking. Uh, by the way, Connie Sir is my advisor, PhD advisor. And uh, there's been some studies on parameterized analysis, which I'm not going to talk about. And most surprisingly, uh, 10 years ago, there, um, these two guys actually from Brown University had a PITAS, which is a really surprising branch and bound algorithm. I have no idea why it's true, but the algorithm itself is not hard to implement. But we know that this uh, NP-hard problem has a pretty good solution, which is PITAS. And most surprisingly, um, in a mathematical social science paper a couple of years ago, uh, Ali and Marina Mela from University of Washington, they have a paper comparing performance of 104 <laughs> algorithms and uh, combinations. So if you want to work on this problem, check out this paper first, uh, see if you can beat. It's not that scary, so you have all kinds of parameters to tune, but uh, eventually, um, that's one of the reasons I'm not directly working on it, because comparing to 104 seems um, pretty scary, so you never know which one's better. But this is kind of the state of the art, but let me just quickly tell you how this MLD, um, uh, sorry, how, how this ILP works. So the nicest thing about this ILP is not the fact that it is computing uh, MLE of MALOS, but it is more like a generic way how to handle, how to model a ranking um, using uh, integer variables. So that actually can be very useful in many other situations. Now, how should we compute uh, MALOS, uh, MLE of MALOS? Um, basically, wait, did I talk about, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, the MLE of MALOS is known as Kamini's rule, independently uh, proposed by, well, of course, somebody called Kamini. And basically, it's the same as given P. Given the preference profile composed of four rankings, you want to compute a ranking for ranking W that minimizes the total kernel power distance from the input profile, right? Because just think about it. Likelihood is multiplication of a probability, and probability is phi rise to the distance. So the likelihood is phi rise to the total distance. And because the, the, the phi is strictly speaking smaller than one, so maximizing likelihood just becomes minimizing the distance which makes total make sense, right? So you have a bunch of profiles, you want to find the center one, minimizing the kernel power distance. All right, so uh, basically we just have this um, um, uh, integer linear programming. Uh, we, we're gonna use a um, bunch of integer variables to represent the W, the ground truth ranking, with a minimum uh, kernel power distance. So uh, we're gonna have M choose two, remember here M is a number of candidates. We're gonna have M choose two binary variables, X, A, B, well, A and B are uh, 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 candidates or alternatives. And uh, X, A, B equals to one means that in the ground truth ranking, A is preferred to B, and otherwise it means that in the ground truth ranking, B is preferred to A. 
Now, it's very easy to represent the goal, which is kind of how distance between the ground truth ranking and the purpose profile as a linear combination of something you can compute it, uh, pre compute it, uh, down in polynomial time, multiplied by xab. And the interesting thing is actually the constraint. You must define constraints so that these combinations of xabs represent linear orders, which is not that straightforward because think about linear orders. It basically says that, right, so there is no, 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 um, uh, the transitivity must be satisfied. So actually, this is exactly what is happening here. Uh, we can have the first constraint, which is xab plus xba equals to one, right? So either a prefers to b or b prefers to a. And the second one basically says there's no cycle of three vertices. Um, for any three pairwise different vertices, uh, candidates abc, xab plus xbc plus xca is no more than two. So that's the condition. But now you may wonder why this means that a, a, a ranking satisfy this condition, or uh, XABs, all of these XABs represent a ranking if and only if they satisfy these conditions, because here we just care about cycle of three. What about the cycle of four, cycle of five? If you're gonna use um, ILP formulations to, 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 to represent this constraint, you can have exponential large number of constraints. Uh, but actually for this particular case, that W is a linear order, it's not too hard to prove that whenever it's a cycle, it must have, there must be a cycle of size three. So the nice thing about it is that uh, cycle, this, this set of uh, linear, uh, sorry, uh, set of um, uh, polynomial number of constraints is enough to represent a ranking. So that's the nicest part about LP. Um, and that's, uh, you can see that we don't need to worry about cycles of more than three vertices. That's um, kind of the baseline of computing ILP for. Um, uh, baseline for computing maximum likelihood estimate of metals. Is there any quick question about this LP, especially this part? Pretty easy once you have said, you, once people have done it, right? So, um, but um, in general for Bayesian inference, um, what we're trying to do here is not to directly make a decision, but we're doing a more general approach, which is if there's any way we can sample rankings, the ground truth rankings in a parameter space, which is back to the posterior distribution, then you can do pretty much what you want, right? So remember that uh, the Bayesian approach is that given the data, we're gonna have a posterior distribution for the parameter space. Usually this is hard to compute, especially in our case, Mel's model, because you have m factorial, m less number of candidates, m factorial things, right now, ground truth ranking in the parameter space. So there's no way you can just do group for a search, right? Now, the problem is that given a prior and some data P, how can you sample a ranking W um, from the posterior probability, okay? And then, once you have the down it, you can just sample it many, many, many times and use the empirical distribution to approximate the uh, posterior distribution. And hopefully, that will give you a good decision because you can just basically define your decision on this empirical distribution, this empirical sampling over the, the ground truth parameters, and that would have a very good uh, approximation um, well, with high probability. You, 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 it's not hard to imagine, so it's, it's pretty standard techniques. But now, the point is that for Mellis model, it seems pretty hard, but how would you even do it for one sample? Equivalently, well, so doing the plan for six, it says that if you see a four ranking, just four word ranking, how would you sample and ground truth ranking uh, from the posterior distribution. So this is, if you think of it a little bit while, this is equivalent to having metals model at hand. I give you the ground truth ranking, ABCD. How can you generate a sample uh, for, for a voter? Just because the, the kinetic distance is symmetric. So it's, uh, you probably need a piece pen of paper to write it down. But if you trust me, that's exactly the same as sampling a data point from metals model. It's not obvious um, because, you can, again, you cannot do brute force search. You cannot just say, like, sampling and, and, and the, the coin, right? So it's binary, either head or tail, but here you have M, M, uh, dice of m factorial basis. How would you do it? Um, but in general, you can, you can use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, but just for the special case of A equals to 1, there's a very nice trick which was discovered pretty late. Uh, means that actually happened in the, in the past 10 or 15 years. This is called uh, repeated insertion model. Very simple, very effective, and very nice to see. So let's quickly go through the algorithm, and I want to talk about the proof a little bit. So it's totally fine if you don't follow the proof, 
but it's actually just a pretty nice idea. Now, what do we want? We want an algorithm that can sample just one ranking given the ground truth. Suppose the ground truth is without the loss of generality, A1, A2, all the way down to AN. Okay. Now, this algorithm, what is there, does, is basically you're starting from an empty ranking. You're going to insert candidates into this ranking one by one in exactly the same order as they appear in the ground truth. This is very important. It must be done in the exact same order. So um, here is how the algorithm works. Just the three lines of code, for example. First, you're going to have an empty partial rank. Okay. Now, in the i's step, suppose you have already inserted uh, i1 through i minus 1. Sorry, a1 through a minus 1 to create a partial ranking. Now, you're going to insert ai into this partial ranking. And just following this formula, you're going to insert ai to position j of the partial ranking over a1 through a minus 1 with probability 5 raised to j minus 1 over kind of a normalization constant 1 plus 5 plus 5 raised to i minus 1. No idea how it works. No idea why it works to some extent. But here is a quick example of how it works. Um, so uh, first you have empty set. You're going to insert a1. There's no choice of a1. a1 can only be in the first place. So a1 is the first mm -hmm. step. Now you're going to insert a2 with probability 5 over 1 and 5. You're going to insert a2 in the first position, creating a partial ranking a2 preferred to a1. And with probability 1 over 1 plus 5, you're going to create a partial ranking a1 plus uh, preferred to a2. So let's suppose um, that we insert a2 in the first place. And then you're going to insert a3 into the first place, second place, third place, with probability that is proportional to phi squared, phi, and 1, respectively. And let's assume that a3 is inserted in second place, then you're going to insert a4, which is proportional to the place, uh, to the first, the second, third, and fourth place, proportional to the probability phi to the third, phi to the second, phi, and 1. So that's a very easy description of the algorithm. So why does it work? It's pretty natural to see why this works, but well, before that, if I go into the quick proof, is there any question about this insertion process? Yes? What does spy represent again? Can I look at that? What does spy represent again? What is what? Spy, oh, spy is a, a dispersion parameter, so um, that's a malice model or, or, in, or distance space model. So you have a five which is space, and um, you have um, probability given the ground truth ranking, generating the ground truth ranking W, Generating V is proportional to phi raised to the Kentau distance between V and W. And Kentau distance is the total number of pairwise difference comparisons between V and W. So yes, so please feel free to ask any questions. So I have reminders from time to time. I mean, reminder slides from time to time, but not the detail on this one. So uh, any questions about this general, um, this repeated insertion model? Okay, so let's quickly go through the proof. Uh, the reason I made this slide mostly just for myself so that I don't forget the proof, but it's, uh, um, I don't know if they prove it this way, but when, when I think about this problem, I did this proof quickly. So maybe I did this wrong, but uh, uh, trust me, this algorithm is correct. Now, um, and this proof uh, more or less leads to um, the general uh, repeated insertion model by um, Pelodou and Craig Boutelier uh, in the JML paper, which I'm not going to explain their algorithm, but we'll see the model for a mixture of miles very soon. So the basic idea is <laughs> just the chain rule, right? So uh, starting from V equals to empty sets, um, this is the algorithm, right? So we're gonna insert AI into the J's position with some probability. Now, where does this probability come from? We actually just need to prove this probability is to some extent correct for two adjacent insertions. So think about, let's say VI is the partial ranking we have done for our a1 through a, I, I'm sorry, so uh, actually I, I'm, I'm now thinking about inserting a, uh, I, I plus one. Okay, so suppose v1 is a four ranking, we have just done for uh, a1 through ai. And now suppose uh, we're gonna insert, let's qi n plus one and ri plus one denote the two different kind of insertions. qi plus one is insertion right before a j, and ri plus one is insertion right after a j star. So j star could be um, one could, could be one, could be two, could be anything you want. But we just need to prove that given the ground truth, the same ground truth W, which is A1, A2, A3, all the way down to AM, the probability of RI plus one is phi 
multiplied by the probability of qi plus 1. Because remember that the probability of, of doing this insertion is proportional to phi raised to uh, something, and this is opposed to uh, this proportional to phi raised to something plus 1. So if we can prove this kind of local ratio of probability, then everything just, just, just follows naturally. Now, how should we prove it? So what does it mean in the first place? I, for example, R i plus 1 is a partial order. It's not a linear order. Is it well-defined? What, what does it mean that given the ground truth W, what is the probability of generating partial order? The way to view it is to view a partial order as an event, as a collection of data points. And in particular here, R i plus 1, this, the, the, this notation here just means that it's the set of all linear orders that are extensions of uh, the partial order i plus one over here. So basically, you're, you're trying to say the probability of a bunch of linear extensions of r i plus one, um, the total probability, equals to phi multiplied um, by the total probability of extensions of um, this q i plus one. So how should we do it? Well, um, very simple trick, which is we're going to build one one uh, correspondence between extensions of i plus one and extensions of uh, q uh, i plus 1 so that uh, the ratio, a uh, probability ratio holds. And then uh, because you are summing them up, so the ratio still holds for the summation. Now, what is this one one correspondence? It's very easy. So for every full rank in q that extends q i plus 1, which is uh, kind of contributing to one of the, the, the part over here, um, you're just going to apply and um, permutation, it's, it's, it's actually just an exchange of ai plus 1 and aj star, so these this two things. So the resultant ranking r must extend ri plus 1. So remember that in an extension of qi plus 1, in extension q, it could be something um, in between ai plus 1 and aj star, but it doesn't matter because you're just exchanging ai plus 1 and aj, that's going to result in another, district, another ranking that extends r i Right? So for any ranking Q extending Q i plus 1, exchange these two positions gives you a unique uh, linear order that extends R i plus 1. Now, if you look carefully, it's not hard to prove that you cannot have this thing, just, just usual thing. So you just you write it down, um, I expand the formula, uh, you can see that cannot have distance between W and R, it's cannot have distance between W and um, Q minus 1. So now, the same, the same thing, right? So for every ranking in Q, you can find another one whose cannot have distance is uh, one closer. So if you sum up all of these um, probabilities, um, you're going to see that um, it's, it's, it just naturally follows this, this, this thing. So um, that's how, uh, why this, uh, there, you know, this repeated insertion model is correct. Uh, any quick questions? So I, I would imagine that um, maybe some of you just, just well, that's boring, so that's totally fine. Uh, if you uh, happen to uh, be curious about how this works, uh, I'd be very happy to clarify um, why, why this holds. Any quick questions? OK, great. So, um, but in general, how can we do um, metropolitan histamine? So how can we do um, MCMC um, sample? Because that particular trick only works for one sample. It breaks down to two samples. When we have two samples, this doesn't work at all. And in general, we can actually prove that when we have multiple samples, the problem is hard to approximate. Sampling this thing is hard to approximate. Now, um, so in a previous paper, we have a uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo method. It's called a um, Metropolis Hastings metric, um, which I don't want to explain in detail, but um, the way it works, I'm just going to explain the algorithm, is that the way it works is that um, it's Markov chain. So in every step, you are starting from a previous ranking, and you're going to generate the next ranking. In the following way, this is our Markov chain. Um, I think it's also called KK chain or whatever. Um, um, so there's another paper by some uh, some professors whose whose names uh, start with K's, and um, that was for counting number of linear extensions of partial orders. So it's exactly it's almost exactly the same. Okay, we didn't realize that, but it's a very simple one anyway. So. Let's say, suppose, currently we have a ranking which is Eric, Stan, Kyle. Well, at least after the talk, you know who, who these guys are. So that's a benefit. Um, Eric, Stan, and Kyle, I'm not going to tell you where they come from because um, that's not a very pleasant thing to talk about. 
I just use them because I have the time to grab anything. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is that uh, for machine process testing, in general, you're going to find an, a proposal this next step. So you're trying to say, oh, let me try to um, propose a next ranking. It's not finalized yet, but let me first generate the next ranking. We'll see how to, uh, if we want to accept it or deny it. Um, the way we're going to generate a next proposal ranking is we pick any adjacent pairwise pair, pair of, of, of candidates and we swap it. What is the probability for doing that? Uniform random. So with one over m minus one, we're going to pick each of these adjacent ones. So in this particular case, with half probability, we're going to pick swap the pairwise condition uh, comparison between Eric and the Stan. With half probability, we're going to swap the pairwise condition between Stan and Kyle. So let's say we uh, happen to pick this uh, two guys, Stan and Kyle. Let's uh, swap them. That's a proposal next distribution. We're not jumping to that distribution yet because there's another kind of coin flip to decide, are we going to jump to this W or are we going to stay at V? Okay, so the probability is, um, actually it's very easy to compute. It's probability, posterior probability of the new distribution, new proposal distribution, uh, new, sorry, new proposal ranking W um, over the posterior um, probability of the old one V. And um, you can safely ignore this mean, well, mean this thing, uh, in, one, th this is natural, but the divided two is just for theoretical analysis, which is pretty common, so in practice, you don't have to divide it by two, but uh, for pretty hardcore analysis, we need to, to have it divided by two for whatever reason. So, uh, and then with this probability, this W will be accepted and will be used as the starting point for the next round, so W will be the next to B. Otherwise, it just started with B. Sounds a like very inefficient chain, right? So uh, you, you Propose something and you have some probability accepted, but if it's not accepted, you are not going anywhere, you just stay where you are. Um, but um, there are many good things about mesh probability testing, and I mean, asymptotically, it actually works pretty well if you don't care too much about the constant. I mean, we're computer scientists. Let me pretend that I'm a theorist, so I don't care too much about the constant. Uh, but anyway, so this is going to be the next step, and then we do this for many, many, many rounds, and hopefully, this will approximate the posterior distribution. So, um, if it's the first time you heard of uh, mesh probability testing, you would say, wow, that's pretty cool. If you have heard of this for many times, you would say, well, designing a Markov chain is trivial, so uh, especially mesh probability testing. So it's, it's pretty trivial to see why it works, but uh, it's not trivial to kind of prove why it works efficiently. So that's all the of hardcore theory comes from. So, I mean, pretty much for all problems, you can, you can easily find a Markov chain, and uh, mesh probability testing pretty much just works pretty well in many of these cases, but uh, proving it works well is not so trivial. So that's what we have done. Uh, actually, uh, we proved that the mixing time of the Markov chain, we just defined um, up, uh, previously, um, is some scary formula, but let's forget many of them. So let me first explain what is the mixing time. The mixing time is um, the number of, so um, at a very high level, it's the number of steps you can approximate your sample distribution, number of, you can, you can draw many samples. Let's say you draw T samples. The number of samples or the number of steps, the sample distribution will um, converge, or will, will be approximately the true distribution with high probability. That's, that's I mean, you can write down the formula, but uh, of course, but that's what it measures. So of course, there's almost no way metropolis hasting will give you uh, exact distribution um, but that's why we need to kind of approximate distribution. So with this number of times uh, of samples, <coughs> um, empirical distribution is very close to the true distribution with high probability. That's what mixing time does. So, um, and if this time, mixing time is polynomial, that's great, that's called fast mixing. But if it's not, um, here is what we got. So the mixing time is polynomial of some other inputs, which because it's polynomial, we don't care. But it depends on um, this critical term, which is phi rise to minus k max, which I'm going to explain soon. So you see that the exponential kind of inevitably because we really believe there's no uh, fast mixing uh, on macro change for this model. Um, but phi is the dispersion parameter. Remember, it's strictly between zero and one. It's given before the model, and k max is something that can be as large as uh, m squared n, but can be also be as low as zero. So we're kind of doing a parameterized uh, mixing term. 
So uh, Kmax, uh, I'm going to give you an example, but um, very quickly, just the maximum cut in the weighted majority graph, which kind of just saying that if the preferences of the agents are more balanced, then uh, Kmax is, is, is very low. So in the best case, it can be zero. So, uh, and we have another theorem, the Markov chain for Kalasin model is representative in that very simple, very, very quick um, trick example. So Kalasin, that's, that's pretty much the only thing we can talk about for Kalasin's model, but I'm not going to talk about the proof for Kalasin's model, but uh, what I'm going to do next is that I'll quickly explain what is Kmax and quickly explain what is the proof behind it, which is a very high level proof, and hope that if, if you have not learned this Markov chain proofs, um, this gives you some very high level idea how it works. Okay, um, I'll take some questions after explaining Kmax. Okay, so suppose we have um, 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 preference profile. We have a bunch of data. Say we here have nine data points. Two of them says that I prefer Eric to stand to Kyle. Three so that says Eric Kyle stand, and four Kyle Eric stand. Now first we're going to build the so-called weighted majority graph, which is a graph where the vertices are the candidates, and um, you have an edge between candidate one to candidate two with weight. That is the number of times that candidate one prefers to number of candidate two minus the number of times that candidate two prefers to candidate one. So why do we have these three numbers? Because so everyone in the preference profile prefers uh, Eric to stand. So if you check it, everyone prefers Eric to stand. So this number is nine. And why the, the, the edge between Eric and the Kyle is one? Because you can check that um, in these five votes, right? So Eric prefers to Kyle, and in the four votes, Kyle is preferred Eric. So um, by definition, this is five minus four, which is one. So if you build this weighted majority graph in this way, and you find the max cut, that's the K-max. So all the, the mixing time of algorithm depends on how large the is. You can easily construct cases while this weighted majority graph is, has, has zeros on every edges. For example, um, um, so people's preferences are inverse to each other. So that's a very easy example, uh, kind of more balanced, where you have Kmax is zero. But if everyone has the same preferences, Kmax is really pretty large. So that's uh, one of the things we have proved. Okay, um, any question about the mixing time sampling from the Mallow's posterior distribution? So just quickly, what I'm doing here is that we have Markov chain, and then we uh, use measures Hastings, and then we can prove that um, the number of, uh, of samples needed to approximate the posterior distribution with high probability is uh, almost um, polynomial something else plus five raised to this Kmax, which depends on the data. Okay. If not, uh, let's go into the scope of the, uh, probably the scary proof. Um, it's not that scary because I, I promise. So the basic idea is uh, use something called the canonic path. Um, there are pretty much just two techniques in proving mixing time. One well, canonic path, the other one is coupling. Coupling, I still don't fully understand it, but uh, it's uh, just, uh, uh, but fortunately we don't need it. So canonic path basically just says that, so think about the parameter space. This is parameter space. We have many, 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 many rankings. Each point is a uh, parameter. Each point is a ranking. <coughs> so let me see what I should have. OK, so we're going to define multiple paths. We're going to define, let's say, we have n factorial parameters in this parameter space. We're going to define n factorial, choose two paths from each pair of um, between each pair of them. So it's a directed path. So uh, for example, let's say here is a V, uh, which is Eric, Kyle, Stan, uh, Eric, Stan, Kyle. Here is another W, which is um, Kyle, Stan, Eric. So you're going to define, predefine some path. So this is your choice. In order to, to prove your chain is rapid mixing, you need to define path. I mean, you don't have to write all of them down, because there's so many of them. But uh, in your mind, you should have a good way to define all of them. Okay? So just define a set of paths. Uh, here is another set of uh, V prime to W prime, for example. And the idea of this path is that you don't want these paths to be overlapping with each other too much. If you can prove that none of these paths is congested, none of this pair of, uh, none of edge, directed edge, is congested, then it's kind of saying that at least we have some way of blowing 
d to w, so it means that I mean, at a very high level, this, this parameter space is kind of well connected and with high probability you can jump from one to another and so on. So uh, this is a very high level idea. Now, what is kinetic path used in our proof? It's a very simple one. So for example, here is a w, here is a v, uh, v and uh, we're gonna use, uh, our path uses adjacent pairwise transpositions, adjacent pairwise flips. Okay, so basically what we're doing is that we're gonna use these flips to make V, to convert V into W. And we do it in a way that we first gonna flip up the first rank candidate in W, which is higher in this case. So how do we do it? We're gonna first flip up um, between, flip between Kyle and Stan, and then we're gonna flip between uh, Kyle and Eric. So that's how we first flip out, make the first rank candidate in W into this. And then we move on to the second place in W, move on to the third place in W, so we're gonna do multiple flips. The next number of flips is, I'm choose two, but apparently this is not, well, it's the maximum one, two, actually it's the maximum in this case. So here we need to make um, a same place, so we just have another flip to, uh, so that the, the rank can become W. So that's how we define a canonic path. Um, and we can actually prove that under this version of canonic path, mixing time is mainly determined by something called maximum edge loading, which is a scary uh, formula, but um, so basically it's trying to, it's the, the basic idea is that we are trying to say that the maximum, um, how say, the most congested edge is not so congested, or it's congested in the polynomial factor, that will be rapid maxing, um, but that's all, all of the fancy techniques by uh, CPA, um, uh, at least I think they are Berkeley um, a couple of years ago. So uh, basically we're just using their algorithm and it's still not trivial to prove why this is, uh, gives our, us the thing we, we had in our paper, but that's pretty much the idea. So what we, can we learn from this? So if we want to prove the mixing time of a Markov chain, one of the first thing you can try is to define canonic path and prove that no uh, edge, no single edge is congested using the formula defined in this way. And then how can you compute it how can you bound this formula? Uh, that's uh, very domain specific. You have to think about how to do it in your problem. So that's kind of the take home message for this one. Now, we are certainly not the only one proposing um, the uh, Markov chain uh, for Mellon's model, for posterior distribution sampling for Mellon's model. Uh, here is another uh, um, paper by two Cornell guys, uh, Cornell universities. I think uh, there are a couple of papers. So this one is, I think it's, it's probably a new conference series. Learning, learning tool, or whatever, I don't remember, but it's <laughs> LITS. So uh, they're still using metropolitan testing, and, and every step, um, so what we did is that we generated the proposal next step by, um, by um, um, flipping uniform and random adjacent pairs, but what they did was uh, pretty smart is that they generated the proposal next ranking, pretending that current state is the ground truth. So this is a V in the, the current state and you're generating proposal distribution W from V and then you do the user things, right? So accepting it with some probability or denying it. So uh, just like the formula over here. And they actually use a very uh, interesting um, um, application which is used for peer grading. Uh, it's a very interesting, very inspiring paper to read and it'll be very interesting to see that this Mellis model can be used for peer grading. Uh, very large scale peer grading, they, there's no way they can check if this uh, Markov chain is uh, even, even efficient because uh, I think uh, at least they have a hundred of candidates. So uh, in our experiments, we did it by brute for, for search, but in their experiment, there's no way you can check the efficiency of their uh, proposed chain, and there's no theoretical guarantee it's known for their chain. So I mean, finding a nice Markov chain, especially with your testing, is not that hard, but uh, how to prove is a good one, or how to uh, maybe justified by experiments is really hardest part, but um, I mean, this is very interesting open question. So just for this particular chain, can we say something about nice, uh, something nice thing about this? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much about the, uh, the uh, Bayesian approach for Malus model. Any questions before we, we move on to learning the mixture model? Okay, um, let me check if uh, actually the uh, website is uploaded. 
upload it. Yeah, so it's still waiting for the server. Okay, so um, now um, we're, we're going to touch the learning the mixtures of Mattel's model. And uh, just a quick reminder, what is a mixture model? Mixture model is a flexible way of combining multiple existing models. So the same the slide said before, um, we have uh, multiple models. Each of them, in this case, is a Mattel's model with probably different um, branches, parameters, and, and it could also have different files, the dispersion parameters. And the way to generate a sample is that you pick, choose one of the models with probability uh, indicated in the dispersion, in, in the mixing coefficients, and then you use that, that particular model to generate your four range. That's how mixing model works. So uh, I'm just going to talk about the setup of the Lewin Botelier paper, uh, which is a very nice one, and um, <laughs> especially because recently we have been working on a problem that we think are pretty nice, but then we figure out it, it's they already solve it uh, in a way uh, that is different from our formulation. But anyway, so uh, the model actually, the model and the algorithm actually works for partial, rank, partial rankings. It's not directly, um, well, it certainly can be applied to linear rankings, but um, what is, it actually works for partial rankings, especially for pairwise comparisons. And the model is somewhat different from uh, the way you would usually imagine a mixing model works, but let me be more specific about it. So now, the point is that everyone gives you a partial ranking. Let's say partial ranking you know, satisfying the, um, the transitivity, so there's no uh, cycles in this partial ranking. Their model is basically <coughs> every agent has a latent full ranking that is compatible with this partial ranking. So basically saying that I do know what is my ranking, but I just don't tell you. You maybe just ask me some pairwise comparisons, and I'm, I'm asking, I'm, I'm telling you uh, what is that, what it jumps out. Uh, maybe it's successful. I don't see. I don't see it's successful or not, but let me try to reload it. It's in the bottom, but oh, it looks like it's showing up. Okay, great. So um, it's uh, the part one. Part two, part three, let me see if I can download all of them. Okay, part two, it can be downloaded. So if you uh, go to my website, you just Google my name. If you don't remember my name, uh, you can look at the program, uh, it's over there. Um, and then you scroll it down, and then uh, tutorials will be over there, just in case you want to look at the slides. Great, it works in the end. Um, <coughs> but their model is basically, we, we have a an, an latent ranking, everyone has some full ranking uh, in their mind, but they just don't tell you because they tell you some pairwise comparisons, for example. And uh, this full ranking is generated according to the usual mixture model, but you just don't observe it. And everyone, so suppose, let's say, we use the usual um, mixture model to generate a full ranking for any, ten, uh, any voter, and then uh, we still need to define how can we generate pairwise comparisons. And the way to do it is, um, um, pretty standard and using a random assumption where you have a beta, uh, which is between, strictly between zero and one, and for every pair of alternatives, uh, independently, you're gonna sample flip a coin, and with beta probability, this pairwise comparison will appear in the data. So you may argue that this may not be the best way to generate partial rankings, but <coughs> it's one of the nice models, and the magic thing is that it turns out that it, it is trackable uh, according to the algorithm. Okay. So you have beta, generate some pairs, and then you're gonna, let's say, you're gonna ask this agent, say, my, uh, what is your preferences over these pairs of comparisons, of pairs of candidates, and then the candidate will just say, uh, look at the projection of this, um, of this latent ranking into pairs, that's the data you're gonna collect. Pretty complicated model, but uh, uh, it's actually not that complicated to read. So again, very quickly, use a mixed model to generate a full ranking for the candidate, and then uh, kind of randomly ask them pairwise comparisons, and then they'll just tell you what are their pairwise comparisons. So that's the generated model. The algorithm is um, pretty hard to describe uh, as part of the tutorial, but at the very high, so please don't worry if you don't quite follow this slide. So this slide is just over there in case you want to take a very quick look 
or you have some idea of, uh, of expectation ma uh, maximization algorithm. So um, what the, the kind of cheap, cheap um, um, technical part is that they have generalized the reputed insertion model using the chain rule, and then they're basically doing kind of a sampling based on the data, sampling the posterior um, over the, the kind of latent, latent ranking. So, uh, and then this is equipped with a multi color expectation, expectation maximization algorithm. Well, you have multiple iterations, and in every iteration, you do an E step, you do an M step, and for the E step, you basically just sample all of the latent variables. So, if it doesn't make sense, please uh, don't worry because um, um, uh, I just want to quickly uh, say it. So, um, you're going to sample all of these latent variables where you don't directly observe. In particular, you're sampling the latent rankings because everyone has a latent ranking, as well as the membership. So, everyone uh, how much do you belong to each of the groups? Just like in our previous experiment, I was asking you guys to raise up a hand, which group do you think you belong to? So this is also something we don't directly observe as a latent variable, but you can certainly use EM to, to sample from it. And then, given all of this, which is actually not trivial to do, because it's a hard problem, so they use approx some approximate sampler based on this general repeated insertion model, and another metropolis case gene method, and then the M step is computing the next parameters um, um, to maximize the expected log likelihood of uh, given all of the sampled latent, var latent variables in this phase, in, in the previous step, and then use that for the next iteration. So many, many multiple iterations, and it turns out to be working pretty well. So that's a very quick um, description of our algorithms. Um, any quick question about the model? Actually, I think the most important part is, is, this, is this model for generating uh, partial orders. Are there any questions? All right, so uh, we need to hurry up because uh, we have just one hour left and um, let me kind of, of quickly skip part of the, the plaque Lewis model thing because I want to move on to elastication and the decision making. So um, plaque Lewis model, um, but if you want to take, talk about the patient of plaque Lewis model, it's a model where uh, every candidate has some quality and the probability of ranking something uh, ranking the candidates uh, corresponds to the order of taking this force out of the uh, an, an untransparent term in, in the way we just described. Okay, so uh, let me describe, and so far I would say it's a, it's a surprisingly um, nice, surprisingly simple, and surprisingly efficient algorithm um, by um, two guys from EPFL, uh, Mr. Grosskos. So if, uh, if any of you know that any of these guys, you, is correct me if my pronunciation is correct. But um, the basic idea is, let's just look at the um, log likelihood, okay? So if, uh, uh, let's look at log likelihood, and they are looking at different type of data, which is choice data in the standard discrete choice model. The choice data basic says that what I observe is a particular type of partial ranking, which is, I give you uh, these three items, I can give you a different a three, a set of three items, and you pick one of them. That's all of the data. Okay, so give you these three, you pick one. Give you another four, you pick one. Give you another 10, you pick one. So that's uh, the choice data. Of course, you can very easily interpret ranking data into choice data in the way we define um, uh, the practice model, but basically the work, the work works for choice data. Now, scary math, um, but if you just write the log likelihood, and uh, it's not too hard to just follow. I mean, there's a slide over there for you to read in detail. But eventually, what we get after some very simple manipulation and um, transformation, eventually what we get is the following formula must be true. So you take the first order conditions, right? Because you want to maximize the log likelihood. So you're going to set the first order of conditions to be zero. And then it turns out that you're going to have, uh, for every candidate AI, this equality. This equation must hold. So what is this equation? So lambda i is the variable you want to figure out. You want to maximize the over. You want to um, maximize the the, uh, the like -like -like over. Um, this is something. This uh, a scary summation. You just ignore all, all of this this this, this um, definitions over here. But basically, it's a function that is related to data as well as uh, the lambdas. So the current kind of a current estimation of the uh, 
parameter. And then equals to summing over all of other candidates j, not equals to i, lambda j, multiplied by another term, which is also uh, can be computed by given the data and given the ground truth. Okay? So some magical formula, but basically um, um, the interpretation is lambda can be seen as the stationary distribution of a Markov chain, which is not a fixed Markov chain, but this chain can be computed by given the data, perfect profile, and the ground truth parameter. So this sounds, sounds like a little bit of secret, right? So we know that lambda is the parameters we want to estimate. We know that it can be done by estimating the stationary distribution of Markov chain. But the point is that this Markov chain itself can only be defined when you know what is the ground truth lambda. Okay. So, and then that gives you immediately the algorithm or the iterative algorithm where we just evaluate lambdas and this Markov chain is this, 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 this um, transition matrix iteratively. That's the algorithm. Surprisingly simple. Uh, actually, that's one of the best, uh, the, the selling point of this paper, which actually is very, it's insanely simple to implement. Okay, so it's called iterative loose um, spectrum ranking. Um, basically, you start with some arbitrary lambda, and you can start with this uniform, this uniform one, the one over n, one over n, uh, one, uh, one over n everywhere. And then you repeatedly compute the m, and uh, in some particular way, which is if you trust me or if you trust them, that's how m is computed. But eventually you're gonna compute uh, the matrix m, and then you're gonna compute the stationary distribution of m and fit it to uh, as uh, the, the lambda for the next step. So because remember that this, this transition matrix depends on the current estimation of the lambda. So that's it, very simple, very nice technique. Um, but we would argue that this is uh, not the best algorithm when we have extremely large data because uh, unfortunately I, have not, I don't have time to talk about this, um, uh, this uh, rank breaking which I really wish but I've given the talk many times so, and I don't feel sorry of skipping my own part of the talk. So, uh, but I'd be, I'd be very happy to explain uh, what it mean. But in general we have another uh, class of techniques uh, and the idea is very quickly we have ranking data. What we do is that we're gonna extract pairwise comparisons in some particular way. Not to extract full pair, all pairwise comparisons, but some hopefully nice ways to extract pairwise comparisons. And then, based on these pairwise comparisons, we're gonna learn the ground truth parameter. And the nice thing about it is that these pairwise comparisons are much easier to optimize over than uh, dealing with the rankings. So, um, skipping lots of them, let me just, uh, um, move to uh, there's optimization with Jaren's method movement, but um, let's not talk about it. So, and we have some characterization of what is a good rank breaking, but let me just um, go directly to um, the, this, in, into the comparison of running time. That's why we are saying IRSR, even though it works pretty nicely and beats our algorithm for small amount of data, uh, for a big amount of data, we believe that it's, it's pretty hard to say which one is better. Um, the reason is that there is a um, baseline algorithm. <laughs> Turns out to be a pretty bad one nowadays. Um, in not, not so old, right? So 15, um, 13 years ago by hands and it's an analysis of statistics paper. Pretty nice one, um, but kind of standard um, um, surrogate function optimization technique. So it's an iterative algorithm and the running time is m cubic m per iteration. So here, m is the number of candidates. m is the number of data points. So if you have big data points, big number of data points, this is pretty slow, and this is per iteration. So the ILSR is this, pretty much this, this complexity is of m squared m plus m raised to some magic number, which is matrix inversion, and this number has to be constantly equal to one constant time. But basically, again, it's per iteration, okay? So you can say every iteration is kind of dominated by m squared m. So uh, if you use our rank breaking technique, we have different kind of breakings. We have a full breaking, basically just to extract all pairwise comparisons. And the complexity is overall, it's not iterative algorithm, it's overall m squared m plus um, this matrix inverse thing. So you can see that um, when um, asymptotically our algorithm complexity is the same as LSR for just one iteration. But nice thing is that um, actually we have another set of, of, of flexible set of um, breaking techniques so that we can reduce the complexity to mn 
plus m raised to some c. But of course, we are sacrificing some statistical efficiency, but hopefully this can be compensated back to the large number of data points. So I'm just uh, saying, when you have really large, the, the large number of data points, say, for example, m is um, some big number that you cannot imagine, all complexity is just no iter not, not iterative algorithm, but just pretty much just dominated by m n, but uh, pretty much all of the previous algorithm is m square n per iteration. So even running one iteration is uh, just not almost not doable. So um, that's uh, kind of the state of the art in this line of research, and this is kind of the um, experiments we have done for trade-off between running time and the statistical efficiency between kind of all kinds of breaking mechanisms, but I'm not going to too much into it. But I do want to um, mention a very nice um, breaking in, in our break framework by uh, Kevin and O from UIUC. Uh, I think it's a combination of two, I don't remember, NIPSA or ICML papers into a JML paper, just accept it. And this is a very nice and magical breaking. So it's weighted breaking. And the way it works is that you're not just breaking this pairwise into pairwise to equally weight pairwise comparisons, but um, I can just give you an example, which is, so here you're gonna break into, again, six pairwise comparisons. So uh, it's A prefers to B, A prefers C, A prefers D. But the weight of each of these pairwise comparisons is third. So to some extent, kind of the, all of the outgoing um, pairwise comparisons of any candidate sum up to one. So the second one uh, for B, pairwise comparison, you have B versus C, B prefers C, B prefers D, and each of them is weighted at half and you have weight one of C prefers to D. So, I mean, you can design any uh, pair bre uh, breaking scheme, but, um, so complexity-wise, it's not that great. It's still n square n. Um, but the, the actually proved, um, using pretty interesting mathematical analysis, it's minimax to some extent. So, it's kind of a very nice theoretical guarantee, which basically says that, think about this breaking. Think about the ground truth. You're gonna evaluate this breaking by the worst case ground truth. And then you're gonna pick the kind of the best uh, worst case in the best worst case scenario. So they actually have some uh, compared to uh, the theoretical uh, lower bound. So it's not a matching lower bound, but they have uh, obtained some magical formula as a good approximation. And then they kind of optimize your, that, over that magical formula and come up with this very neat and very nice uh, breaking. It works pretty well in practice and it can be extended to certain partial orders. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the state of the art. And then for optimization, you can use pretty much every technique. But the nice thing here is about a very particularly nice breaking with good theoretical guarantee. Okay. Any quick question about uh, the IRSR algorithm and uh, the direct breaking framework for learning practice model? Okay. So. Um, we haven't talked about mixtures yet. Uh, again, I'm going to go through it very quickly. Mixture of plaque views, right? So you have here a sample of two, mixture of two plaque views. Some probability you're going to generate, 20% of the time, you're going to generate a ranking from the first model. 80% of the time, you're going to generate from the second model. And then uh, that's, uh, that's the mixture model. So, and we still have this Irish election voting blocks. Every column corresponds to a plaque views component. And within every column, uh, the height of this block corresponds to this lambda, how large the lambda is. Okay, so notice that they have five candidates, and using four, um, um, four factors components to fit this data. One of the questions you may ask is that, well, you just design some magic algorithms and you claim this is how it works, just like I claim that there are two groups and I ask everyone to raise their hand, it doesn't turn out to be work very nicely, which is actually hard to say because if you are 51% preferred to our um, deep learning, 49% uh, preferred to um, uh, reinforcement learning, then you are voting for deep learning, but it doesn't really mean that uh, that, that is wrong. Actually, I think that was correct to some extent because um, deep learning was slightly higher um, but anyway, so how can we say this is correct? In principle, you can never say this is correct because this is not a supervised learning setting. You never know what is the ground truth. But at least mathematically, you can, we can say, in some cases, this answer is not correct. 
that's actually related to decision making, right? So just based on the parameters, on the parameters you have learned, how can you say this parameter is, is, is the ground truth? Again, parameter itself um, doesn't mean anything. It's just an index, mathematically, it's just an index to a distribution. So why can you make any sense of the parameters? So, um, but as I said, there is a particular case where we can say this type of reasoning is wrong. That um, is related to something called the identifiability of a statistical model. So the identifiability basically says that within this statistical model, any two different parameters will give you different distribution over data. Sounds natural, right? So what if two, two parameters give you the same distribution? Then, based on the data, using any statistical method, there's no way you can say which one is the ground truth because they look exactly the same, right? So how can you say, for example, how can you say this is a real logic, um, logic chat um, presenter, this is a ripoff? I mean, if they look exactly the same and their function is exactly the same, there's no way you can tell which one's which. This is what, is, is what happens for identifiability because you can only observe the data and all of the statistical reasoning is based on the data, based on the model. But if the model says these two are indistinguishable, there's no way we can say which one is. That's the basic idea. So in terms of the Plaquenius um, um, mixture, it basically says just that uh, we have a um, Plaquenius model here, <coughs> model here. We have another Plaquenius mixture model here. What if these two have exactly the same distribution of the data? There's no way you can say which one is which. That's the basic idea. But uh, um, kind of surprisingly, um, we previously we didn't see any uh, study on identifiability, especially for the um, for the error selection data set, right? So you have designed algorithm, you have draw some conclusions, and you say that's uh, that's what happens. But is that correct? Um, we actually proved that, unfortunately, when the number of candidates m is no more than two times the mixing coefficient uh, number of number of components k minus one, if this happens, then the model is not identifiable. If you think about the dominant Murphy case, m equals to 5, k equals to 4, and it's no more than 2k minus 1. So they are using a non identifiable model to fix the data and draw the conclusion on it. Not saying that their conclusion is wrong, because nobody knows what is correct, nobody is wrong. But when you are dealing with a mixture model, when you're dealing with a model and you want to interpret the parameter you have learned, you must be very careful when, when, when you're dealing it for a non identifiable model. So that's kind of a lesson. Again, I'm not saying your conclusion is wrong, or your conclusion is kind of not that powerful, but just saying that more justification must, is necessary and you must be very careful when interpreting the parameters in general. But if you would just want to use to interpret the, 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 um, the parameters to do prediction, it doesn't really matter. Because if I just want to use the presenter for this um, tutorial, it doesn't really matter if it's real logic or real ripoff if, if they, their function is exactly the same. I don't care which one is which. I don't care what it's called. But if you want to say this one is real logic tech, this one is rip of logic tech, you must be very careful when the model is not identifiable. That's pretty much the basic point. I'm really very thankful to uh, the conference room offering me uh, this real logic tech so I can make an example of that. I didn't expect it. Um, but anyway, so, so we do have some uh, good news. When m is at least a 4, when k equals to 2, mixing of two, uh, two complex components, the model is identifiable. And uh, we have some generic identifiability, which I'm not gonna talk about under much milder conditions. So let's just think about the experiments we did, right? So we're using a mixture of two components to fit you guys' data, uh, preferential data, over these 11 candidates. So at least the model itself is identifiable. Whether or not our algorithm is good, that's a different story. We have uh, some, some analysis in it, and we prove that it's nice, and prove it's um, uh, converges, but I just want no time to talk about this algorithm. Okay, so quickly <laughs> trying to summarize in the um, learning part, which um, I only have 40 minutes left. Learning part, um, we have been looking at two types of models, um, descent-based model and a random interval model. For each of the model, we are looking at NLE and Bayes interface. So pretty much many of this has been, many of these gaps have been filling up. Uh, we haven't really talked about counters yet, um, but it's, it's pretty easy um, in many cases. And um, we haven't talked about Bayesian approaches for uh, Packet use model, but uh, a couple of papers on that. 
we haven't talked about a general random machine model at all, especially the random machine model with Gaussian distributions, but uh, we do have some, uh, previously we do have some uh, uh, results. Uh, actually, this should be three, okay, I'm um, sorry, I, I, I completely got this wrong. So two, uh, two is done by um, previous work by Jose and Ariel, Larry, uh, David Parks and me uh, previously, but three is, uh, we're kind of doing it uh, right now. And the mixture, um, it's still not clear how can we do Bayesian for mixture of uh, general random machine models, but um, there's just many open questions ahead. Okay, so um, any quick question about the learning part? We actually finished now the learning part. So what have we learned so far? We have learned models, some learning algorithms, some open questions, and um, maybe some ideas about at hand file. But so, any quick questions? Okay. All right, so let's move on to elicitation. Uh, remember, what is the role of elicitation? So previously we just assumed in the learning part that the data are already given to you, the rankings. So how do you come up with the rankings? What if it's, it's too much to ask everyone for rankings, for example, I don't know any of you who actually give a ranking, full ranking over these 11 candidates. So did any of you rank, uh, give a full ranking over these 11 candidates, these 11 areas? Please raise up a hand. I'll be very proud of you because you really uh, spend a lot of time thinking about it. But usually that's too much, right? So even 11 candidates is too much. What if you are in many situations, you have thousands, millions of websites, so how can you get that part of preference to that part of information? Well, that's you know, part of the investigation. And we're just gonna have three slides on it, I promise. Um, motivation is that obtaining four rankings are hard. Even four rankings over 11 candidates are hard. Um, well, actually should be 11. Now, what if, but at least, what if you can ask everyone no more than three pairwise comparisons? That's a more trackable goal. It doesn't have to be three, three is just a number, random number, say. You can decide how many um, pairwise comparisons you can ask everyone, or you can just ask everyone uh, any kind of other questions, like what is the top choice, you give me the top three choice, and so on, okay? Now, the question is that, what questions should you ask? Should, you, uh, should I ask you what is a pairwise comparison between uh, reinforcement learning and, and uh, deep learning? That seems to be a valid question, because these two seems to be the leading uh, competitors to each other, but is there any principle behind this, principled idea to have this problem. Certainly there are millions of uh, heuristics you can do, uh, like the most closest one or whatever, but uh, what is science behind it? Should we do it randomly? Such a terrible idea. Should we do it kind of saying we're going to um, try to get a an, 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 an most informative question, but then what does it mean by most um, informative question? And how can you measure information in just one question? And in particular, I'm giving an example as one pairwise comparison. And remember that this is, should be done with respect to your goal. So what, what is the decision you want to make? You cannot just ask random uh, questions because some question might be more informative for one decision problem, but some might be more informative for the other decision problem. Okay. Now, um, the second slide, I'm on the third three ones. So um, there's a whole field called uh, experimental design, and I believe it's closely related to active learning. The idea is that it's a greedy, a set of greedy heuristics, um, but we're kind of greedy asking questions to the, with maximum expected information gain. I'll be specific about what it's mean. So the basic idea is that, let's say, here is the data P you currently get. Can be pairwise, can be ran, uh, ranking, can be top three, top four, or whatever. Now, let me try to evaluate uh, at least the expected information gain in some pairwise comparison. But let's say, um, given this P, before, before we ask a question, let's think about how much information is contained in this data. So um, given this P, we have a posterior distribution over a parameter. So if the posterior distribution is deterministic, there's no reason to ask any more questions because we already know this must be the bottom truth. But in general, you, have, you can define an information measure, which I will be more specific in the next slide. We can define an information measure directly on the posterior distribution. That kind of telling you how much information is in this data. Because you want to make a decision based on, pretty much on the posterior distribution, pretending we're Bayesians, okay? Now, what if I'm asking you a question? 
What do you think is better? Which one do you prefer, A or B? I don't know your answer yet, but let's say um, with some probability you would say yeah, I prefer A to B, with some probability you would say uh, B prefers to A, and let's just look at one case, okay? So what if you tell me A prefers to B? Now we have a new data set, P plus A prefers to B. It gives you another posterior distribution and can be different from posterior distribution of just P. And you can, you can measure how much information in this posterior distribution and let's call it FA. What if your answer is B prefers to A? Similarly, you have another posterior distribution. You can use the <coughs> same information measure to say how much information is contained in this posterior distribution and let's call it FB. Now, the problem is almost down because you want to, but you don't really know what his answer could be. So suppose that you know, you know with probability, given the current data, with probability, this thing, probability A prefers to B, this guy's answer would be A prefers to B, and then the information would be FA, um, um, weighted by the probability that the answer is A prefers to B, plus the information of um, the data plot, um, come from with B prefers to A, weighted by the probability that the guy's answer is B prefers to A. That's um, the expected information, and when you say gain it, you need to take out the previous information. I mean, but it that doesn't, that is not necessary. You don't have to take that when you're taking the expectation, when you're taking the maximization. Okay, so this is, at a very high level, what do we mean by expected information gain? Expectation is taking over <coughs> all of the potential answers to the question you're asking. Okay, but in practice, how would you estimate this? Well, um, you, you, you're just gonna use all kinds of approximations to do this. So any quick question about the idea of experiment design is expected information gain? Just very simple, very natural. Now, um, the, now the problem is that, so you can ask A, A versus B, you can ask B versus C, you can ask what is the top choice. All kinds of questions you can ask, right? So for each of the questions, you, uh, you can compute the expected information gain, and then you're gonna uh, ask a question with the maximum expected information gain. That's the basic key of the experiment design framework. I think it was first motivated being in medical domains where experiments are very costly, so you cannot afford to collect big data, so you have to uh, find the data with more information, but it can be used in many situations. All right, so now, um, how does it work exactly? What are this information uh, criteria? Well, um, and the first thing you, would th you should think about is the general information. So uh, this is called de-optimality. You have no idea why it's called de-optimality, but not just general information. Um, uh, general uh, optimality, but certainly I'm just uh, listing a few uh, information criteria. The optimality, you can Google whether they mean uh, exactly. There's also another E optimality, which is uh, minimizing value of the picture information matrix and uh, whatever it means. But uh, there are all kinds of uh, fancy tricks, uh, fancy definitions about the eigenvalue of whatever information matrix in this uh, field. And we also define some rank optimality in our previous paper. Basically, the idea is that we want to make the the, the ranking as certain as possible, so we are kind of asking the critical uh, questions um, to make this uh, the least, the most uncertain pair as comparisons uh, improve the such certainty in that part. So it sounds a little bit hard to say that, but it's the same idea as um, the reinforcement learning versus deep learning thing, right? So you identify that these two might be competitors, might be close competitors, so I'm going to ask a question about that. So same high level idea, but um, we, we kind of um, complicated way of saying. That's a way to publish paper, right? So in order to, for your paper to be published, you have to find um, um, scary math for saying something simple. Uh, but hopefully you're doing it in a principled way, but not just for publishing papers. So, uh, and of course you should ask like, how well it works in practice. Um, unfortunately, there's not too much theory. You can say this is a good way because um, you're just trying to minimize variance to some extent. And this can be seriously biased. Let's say, suppose uh, we are trying to estimate um, the empirical mean, the population mean of this series, and suppose you have a way to choose the data to minimize uh, variance, and then, I mean, you would just say one, 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 and the variance is zero, but uh, the bias is huge. So, um, I mean, this, this is, uh, unfortunately, this is how uh, kind of the defect of this total line of research, but in practice, it looks, uh, works pretty nicely. Um, I'm just, I mean, I'm not, not describing what is the setup, um, of this in our paper, and I'm sure you can find many, many, many uh, figures of experimental design, but this one is particularly related to rank aggregation. I think this one is for 
uh, no Kensuji data, uh, not so many data points, but we have done some uh, asking questions, asking different type of agents, their top choice, oh, sorry, on the full rankings. And um, if you look at the random, it's, uh, it's hard to say which one is much better, but the scale seems to be a little bit bad. But um, random is a blue guy, and uh, the proposed method is rank efficiency is uh, kind of uh, doing pretty well, and also the, uh, the standard general information DOP method also works pretty well. But DOP method is a very generic thing, it can be applied uh, anywhere. So the take home message is that not saying that experimental design or experiment, uh, maximizing expected information gain is great, but it's just a different option. So instead of asking random, instead of other heuristics, this, uh, there is a class of hopefully principled mechanisms to compute which pair to ask, which, which questions to ask. And you can probably try it in your experiments and whether or not it works nicely, we don't know. It's certainly an um, application dependent problem but at least we have many more options rather than just random and some simple heuristics. That's the take-home message of elastation. Okay, half an hour left. Let's uh, very quickly go into decision-making part. Well, but I should, probably should ask any questions. Are, are there any questions? Um, uh, yes. The previous slide. Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, when you look at, at the random approach, mm -hmm. uh, it seems not that bad. Yeah. 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 So, yes. how would you interpret it? Why is that? Yes, um, so it's just, um, um, it's highly dependent on um, many things about the application. So maybe this is not a good data, it's not a good application, or maybe randomness is actually pretty good to some extent. Actually, when you have a large number of uh, samples, random is pretty good, it's unbiased, and we can see the coverage is pretty good. And we do have other um, simulated examples where random mm -hmm. works uh, pretty uh, badly. I'm sure you can find examples where the random is the best one. So uh, that sort of thing. So we're not saying this is the different, this must be the way to go, as there are many um, uh, optimality information criteria. So we're <laughs> saying here is a bunch of kind of principal method to try. So which one works best to be dependent on the amount? And we're not always saying random is the must be the worst, just because of the bias thing, because of many things. Yeah, that's a very good point. So um, currently what we're doing is we're trying to test some experiments on some partial uh, data. So like we're doing this um, with other applications with IBM and we figured out that we have merchant that we choose a man um, and this our own our uh, that's a question. It's, it's better than uh, random. So um, but uh, that's the best we can think of, but if you have any bad ideas, that's what we're very happy to do it because that's a very practical problem. You cannot just ask the CEOs to rank a thousand companies. I'm going to skip a lot of things, but uh, I don't want to skip the overview. So um, we have talked about um, the uh, learning, but learning is more like estimating the parameters so far, a building up um, posterior distribution over the parameters. Based on this, we still have to make a decision. So the decision should not always be just what is the ground truth parameter. For example, I'm asking you to say, whom should we give uh, the offer to, Eric, Stan, or Kyle? You run mixture models, you've got some components, and you've got a uh, mixing coefficient. But eventually, you have to tell me whom should we give the offer to, right? So now, what is the principal approach to this type of things? Oops. I know why this happens, because I clicked the height. The first time I did that, I was in panic, and I was trying to figure out if my computer was wrong. But it uh, turns out to be just this magic hiding thing. But um, first, we're going to talk about statistical decision theory. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, that's great. So this is a great theory. At least I hope this can be some of the typical messages. Um, um, but we're going to focus on Bayesian estimators. So these are all known. These are standard statistics and uh, um, but application to the, the, the rank, the social choice problem, the, the decision-making with rank data problem seems to be pretty new. 
Uh, but then we should talk about fairness. Um, and I want to bring everyone's attention to social choice theory because remember that our department chair when making this decision says that the mechanism must be fair in, case that, in the sense that everyone can cast, must cast one vote, no discount. So you cannot just do this, this uh, fancy um, uh, boosting type of uh, ideas or whatever ideas. So I mean, everyone has, must have the same weight. How can we say a mechanism is fair? That's what social choice is all about. And how can we say if a particular type of mechanism is fair or not? Uh, we're going to see some possibility theorems, but also some new mechanisms and possibility theorems. So we want new mechanisms to be evaluated from the unified perspective of statistics, uh, economics, and the computation. This seems to be pretty new um, idea, and uh, I will also give a, a, a very career talk and probably mostly um, this unified um, um, uh, consideration. So, and the last part is more like a ongoing work. It has been ongoing for four years, um, but um, the basic idea is that um, that's nice, but is there any way you can design a machine that can automatically design a mechanism for me, for my application? Application specific mechanism design, which is back to social choice theory. So that's uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give this very nice example, just showing that um, different school of thoughts give you different answers. Uh, even though uh, the, you cannot just do it by looking at the parameter estimation. But you, can, you can use this example online, but the whole purpose is to show that following different principles, you're going to have different answers to the same question. Pretty nice example. Um, now, what is statistical decision theory? Um, it has two parts, basically. One part is the statistics, the, sorry, the, the, the statistical models. And the other part is decision making. So the nice thing is that it separates the uh, statistical model and decision making by explicitly modeling the decision space. So think about, this is a model, let's say this is a mixture of factors model. And you have decision space which is, which candidate should we give an offer? So it's a set of all candidates. The nice thing is that you can also define a loss function, a magical loss function, which takes two things as input. One is an um, parameter theta in parameter space, and the other one is d in the, um, so, uh, I'm explaining it later on. Okay. Yeah, so another is that um, a decision in the d in the decision space. So this loss function evaluates what? Evaluates your decision with respect to the ground truth parameter. That sounds strange. It basically says that if the ground truth is theta, and you make decision d, what is the loss of that? But the point is that you never know what is going to choose. You have some probabilistic idea, for example, in the Bayesian sense, you have some posterior distribution of it, or maybe in the frequency sense, you have nothing about it. So you know nothing about it, and you cannot um, build it into the probabilistic space. Now, uh, what, what you're going to do with it? Okay. So the whole um, statistical decision theory tries to say, let's try to design a good decision function, which cannot take our input as, uh, cannot take the ground truth as input because you have no idea what is the ground truth. So it must take data as input and tells you the decision to make. A special case is a standard um, parameter, parameter estimation, right? So if the decision space is the same as the parameter space, um, a decision function is just an estimation function. You can use MLE, you can use MAP, whatever you want, but in general, this can be very different. And there are two kinds of principled ideas, approaches to work this problem. They have different ways of evaluating uh, what is a good decision function. So I think this is really the difference between Bayesian and frequentist. So when I was learning statistics, I mean, everyone telling me, I was reading lots of discussions online, textbook, what is frequentist versus Bayesian. And people just explain high level things like, oh, uh, frequentist thinks that um, you will have, um, the, the, the ground truth is fixed and you, you can just doing um, repeated experiments, Bayesian things, um, it's part of the probability space. It just confused me so much until I learned this. And it turns out that um, my understanding is that um, it doesn't really matter if you call a method as frequency or Bayesian, it doesn't matter. It really depends on how you evaluate this mechanism. So here is how Bayesians evaluate um, um, decision function. So it is called expected loss in the Bayesian sense that um, you have the data, you have decision. Let's first look at the posterior distribution over a parameter. So 
So given this evidence, what is posterior distribution over the ground truth? And then you can say, we can evaluate decision B with respect to this unknown ground truth, because now we know what is probability of every ground truth parameter. Very easy, right? So condition on, uh, kind of you know that uh, uh, this is a mixture model, this distribution of the, the, the ground truth parameters in the mixture model, what is the uh, uh, expected loss on each given offer to Eric, where expectation is taken over the posterior pro probability. Very simple, very nice to understand. Frequentist expected loss is slightly more complicated. You can see all of the idea of fixing the ground truth and randomly generated samples over here, but uh, I think I really believe that mathematical formulas are really the, the, the kind of things we should focus on. So, the frequentist loss uh, focus on taking these two things as input. So it's not taking the decision. So look at Bayesian. Bayesian says, I'm going to evaluate a decision against the data. That's not what frequent is doing. Frequent is saying that I'm going to evaluate the decision function with respect to some ground truth, which I don't know, but let's just bear it for a while. Let's assume that I know theta. What is your, uh, how well is your decision function? Not how well is your decision, but how well is your decision function? So now here comes the frequency idea. Say, given this ground truth theta, we can generate samples. We can generate samples by kind of repeating this many, many times. And then for each of the sample, you can look at what is the decision for the sample, f theta, and then what is the loss of the decision with respect to the ground truth. And now we know the ground truth because we assume that it is theta in the first place. You see that expectation here is taken over all of the samples generated from the ground truth which is kind of fixed, assuming uh, at the input. But then, of course, you would say, well, uh, we have some app works well for some theta one, but it works terrible some, for some theta two. How should you choose the app? In that case, um, you can find a minimax thing. You're going to find a robust reasoning, a robust decision mechanism, which minimizes the max um, um, expected, frequently expected loss. That's one of the ways to, to think about this problem. But usually, you can think about it. So, uh, usually Bayesian is easier in the sense that you don't need to define the whole F in the beginning. So you see the data, you compute posterior, you, you, you compute the decision. But frequentist, you have to design an F before running this experiment. You have to think about all possible uh, kind of data and see which, uh, whether or not this, this function is a good function. So it's uh, pretty hard in this sense that you, you have to have this function in mind. In mind when evaluating, um, um, when, when you want to take a frequentist way of dealing with a problem. But the nice thing about it is that it's robust reasoning. You don't have to worry about priors in Bayesian, right? So why some priors are more uh, deformative or for some priors more likely to happen than others, you don't have to worry about that. But uh, again, I'm not saying that I prefer Bayesian or frequentist, but um, it's just really this different school of thought. And uh, it would be great, so just like usually what is your opinion about a worst case analysis? It'd be great if worst case analysis is great. That's the best thing. But if not, uh, maybe average case makes more sense, maybe approximately worst case makes sense, or, or whatever. So it's, um, th this is uh, the criterion. So um, now, uh, we're going to focus on Bayesian estimators. Basically, um, this gives us a mechanism. Given the data, um, um, you're just going to compute the, the decision that maximize, minimizes expected loss in the Bayesian sense. So um, now having a model, we already have a mechanism, which is the Bayesian estimator corresponding to this, uh, this, this model. I mean, everything is just straight um, forward, and you can find it in pretty much every statistical test book. Um, but I want to describe this um, <laughs> funny thing. So the many applications of Bayesian estimators. Um, and I was looking at this uh, IMD top 200 movie le uh, list. And uh, these are quotes from them. So basically, they have a ranking for um, for ranking over these movies. Um, and uh, they claim themselves using a complex voter weighting system. And it's accurate because it's a true Bayesian estimate. Uh, what is true Bayesian estimate? No, I, I, have, I have absolutely no idea what it means. I think I understand the formula. And I think I can try to find a justification for them with respect to some prior. But again, I mean, Choosing the prior is not true. Um, it's, and and the, the nice thing about it is that they claim this mechanism to be fair. This really triggers me, okay? So you guys, you're, you're, you're claiming to be fair. So what do you mean by fairness? 
Um, they're of course a different voice. So uh, there's actually very nice um, uh, frequently asked questions online. So somebody says, leave it, uh, it's actually a top question. This mechanism is unfair because uh, it's a weird reasoning because um, that film has received awards, which reviews, commendations, and deserve a much higher vote, but you didn't rank it high, so that's unfair. Well, I mean, uh, different people have different preferences, so it's perfectly possible to in my understanding. And the answer is also uh, very weird. So I don't think they are you know, ask, asking the right question. I don't think I'm devious to answering the question in the right way, no matter what it means. Uh, I'm devious to say, only votes cast by individual users are counted. We do not delete or alter individual votes. So what? I mean, that's not any question. All right, so here comes the question. Uh, why it triggers me, because why can measure fairness? Because in social choice theory, um, there's a whole a um, lot of definition of fairness, um, mathematical definition, but it's not about fairness of the winner. You can never say if the winner is fair or not, because it might be fair to someone, it might be fair, not fair to anyone else. So you can never say the winner is fair, but what you can say is procedural fairness. Before looking at the profile, before looking at the winner, at least we can make sure that this procedure, this mechanism is fair, and the outcome might be unfair to someone just because different people have different preferences. You must obey to the majority. That's the end of the story. Okay? Procedural fairness. Um, I'm going to give you um, just one example. You're going to have many examples. So um, like strict condensate criterion. It's a slightly complicated one, but uh, it's going to be useful in, uh, later on. Um, so strict condensate criterion basically says that whenever there is a weak condensate winner, in the preference profile, that weak condensate winner must be the overall winner. So condensate is the same guy as in the condensate jury theorem. So what is a weak condensate winner? A weak condensate winner is a candidate that never loses to pairwise head-to-head -head competitions. It can be tied, but it can never lose. Okay? For example, in this case, we have two rankings, uh, Eric, Kyle, Stan, Kyle, and, uh, sorry, I'm just saying that wrong. Eric, Kyle, Stan, Kyle, Eric, Stan. And then you look at pair to pair head-to-head uh, uh, -head competition graph. There's a tie between Eric and uh, Kyle, and both of them beats um, Stan because both of them, both votes prefer Stan, but one vote prefers to Eric, while the other one prefers uh, Kyle. Okay. So in this case, there are two weak counters and winners, um, Eric and Kyle, and both of them should be the winner. That's what the, the strict counter criteria requires. Why this is a fairness condition? Because it's kind of a fairness for obviously strong candidates. Whenever you see this head to head competition, we would say, this guy's obviously strong, so we should, we should, this mechanism should be fair so that we should not choose anyone that is uh, obviously weaker than them. So that's one of the justifications. You may not agree with this justification, but uh, there are many, many other definitions of fairness, so that's, uh, that's the beauty about social choice. Not everyone agrees on everything, not like mathematics. Um, but anyway, so um, this is one of the most common theorem, uh, uh, axiomatical properties about fairness. Uh, actually, I'm cheating because uh, condensate criterion is one of the most common ones. So uh, strict condensate criterion is a common one for um, multi-winner um, elections. By the way, there is a nice tutorial on multi-winner election yesterday, but it's already passed, so I don't know what the point of the is. Um, you can look at the, the, the slides again. Um, many other fairness axioms, we're just going to skip all of them. And uh, um, if you have heard of Arrow's impossibility theorem, may I ask how many of you have heard of Arrow's impossibility theorem? Does it make some okay. Okay, so, okay. So uh, Arrow, um, there's a Kenneth Arrow who just passed away a few months ago, I believe. So uh, it's probably uh, one of the, the most famous theorem in the social choice. It basically says that there is no mechanism satisfying combination of, of the three um, natural axiomatic properties. So interpretation is that no mechanism is fair uh, by all means uh, uh, because of this impossibility theorem. So, um, but I can prove a much simpler impossibility theorem characterizing um, the, the, thin, uh, um, the thin message, but, oh, okay, sorry, I, I don't have time to know it and because I have to define anonymity and neutrality, but just following Arrow's impossibility theorem and this very easy impossibility theorem we can say that no mechanism is fair by all means. So some social choice scientists defined um, some notions of, of procedural fairness, and there's no mechanism can satisfy all of them. OK, 
okay, that's fine. But now the new question is that can Bayesian estimators be fair? Right? So this is motivated by a properly biased MDB thing, right? So they want to say our mechanism is fair, this is fair, but can it be fair in a standard surgical sense? And more generally, in a surgical setting, we want to make a nice decision how can we see if the mechanism is fair, and especially when we want to use Bayesian estimator, which is kind of justified from a statistical perspective. Okay. I pr um, proved the unpopular theorem, which basically says that no estimate, Bayesian estimator of any finite model, where the parameter space and sample space are, are um, finite, for example, on the mouse model. So not, not for the practical use model, even though I believe the proof can be extended to continuous models. So a no Bayesian estimator can satisfy strict composite criteria. So that's, um, the, uh, it's kind of surprising because um, you would expect that Bayesian estimator um, can satisfy a lot of, a lot of um, axiomatic properties, but not particularly not this one. How about the other ones? Um, well, um, so I'm gonna skip all of this. We have um, just a quick reminder what is mouse model, but we can define a new Bayesian estimator uh, with respect to mouse model and the particular loss function. So, uh, wait, wait, so um, particular loss function, which is border loss function, which basically says that, remember in the mouse model, the branch is W, right? So that's a branch is ranking. And if you can make a decision choosing the winner, to give the offer, for example. If the winner, A, is um, ranked at the top of W, uh, then but, uh, well, this is actually uh, for, not for mouse, but uh, I, I So this is not for the mouse model, but this is for Conosys model. But anyway, so you can naturally extend this notion to Conosys model, and then you can define the Bayesian estimator of this. And we actually showed that this mechanism um, satisfies many good axiomatic properties. So the question of which Bayesian estimators can be fair, or, or sorry, in other words, which fairness can be satisfied by Bayesian estimators is uh, pretty encouraging. Basically says that, so if you look at this mechanism, it satisfies some of this which I didn't define. It cannot satisfy strict Conosay because it's positive theorem. It's satisfying a weaker Conosay and it can be computed in polynomial time. So the bigger picture is that we want to design good mechanisms from unified perspective, statistics, economics, and computation. And at least we find one by hand uh, to some extent. And uh, there's another one, but I'm not going to follow it. <coughs> Looks nice, but they're still designing mechanism by hand. So, and I'm gonna design a mechanism for you, your particular application. Uh, you're gonna call me and then I come to your place and then you treat me a meal and then I design a mechanism for you. Um, I'm happy to do it, especially I mean, my graduate students need to find place to work. So, um, but in general, I'm going to kill their work by uh, saying it, it'd be great if there is an automated, automated mechanism design framework uh, kind of in visualize, you can visualize this in a magic mirror, and then you're kind of saying, can you give me a mirror that can give me a mechanism for my problem that is more fair, and I want this to satisfy um, strict concept criteria, I want to be strategy proof, I want to be um, um, completely important over time, I want to be approximately uh, accurate with respect to mixture of vectors model, a bunch of uh, criteria that this mechanism should satisfy, and hopefully this magic mirror, which I'm trying to build, not completely yet, can give us a mechanism with these properties. Okay, so um, the basic idea is uh, very quickly, um, the, the, the kind of new technique is that um, we can actually um, interpret satisfaction of fairness conditions as data generation rules. Um, it turns out that this is not a new idea. I later on read some papers, previous papers, but not for the learning part. So um, basically, um, the satisfaction of an axiomatic property, you can say, given that I know this profile, we're gonna do a supervised learning, okay? So um, I, I, if you, I already know that this profile should select this winner, and then given that this mechanism satisfies strategy proofness, we have a bunch of other data points, new data points. Say, we know that in another data point, the winner cannot be something, another data point, the winner cannot be something, and so on. So this is actually a very flexible, flexible way of turning pretty much all absolute choice axiomatic properties or fairness conditions into data generation rules. So eventually then what we have is that uh, the, the framework, say we have um, some data um, from the experts, it's a very nice paper by Leopold Kutcher and uh, others, 
um, uh, AIJ to a couple of years ago. Uh, but there, the idea is that uh, you're going to just ask apps experts, let's say, uh, they're going to tell you, this is the preference profile, this is the winner. If you have many of this, what is the more complexity to learn a percentage score? Um, but we, we're actually going beyond that. We're actually saying um, we further need the mechanism to satisfy some fairness conditions. And then the way we're going to do it is that we're going to generate many, many, many new data. Because, I mean, the data from experts can, you cannot ask so many experts many times. So we're going to have a way to generate a finite number of data points. And then we're going to learn a mechanism with a minimum um, kind of, of objective, which is error rate for um, uh, satisfaction of each type of XML properties, which I'm not talking about in detail, but there's a way of trying to evaluate with respect to the new data we generated. And uh, we are kind of exploring and having found a good grad students work on it, um, but how can we generate it efficiently and through a guarantee? How can we model simplicity of the mechanism? And so on. Um, but before the end, I want to quickly talk about um, um, what is the class of mechanisms I want to learn from. Um, it's basically, we don't want to vary just like choosing the hypothesis class for machine learning, right? So we don't want it to be too restrictive because otherwise, I mean, you won't have good performance. You don't want to be too general, otherwise, um, um, for example, the set of all functions, you're not going to learn anything interesting. Uh, and it must be easy to learn, and hopefully it corresponds to linear classifiers or some kernels at some point, maybe. Uh, I don't know yet. Um, but the um, quick answer is that I got one, um, which uh, uh, kind of uh, satisfies all these conditions, and it generalizes many previously, previously studied voting rules, and um, and much winner elections, uh, election rules, and also uh, can be efficiently learned as kind of linear uh, separators in a different uh, uh, parameter, uh, sorry, different feature space. So uh, that's kind of the ongoing work. Okay. So I need to talk about future work a little bit, but um, let me quickly summarize what I have talked about today. Um, three parts, learning, elastication, and decision making. So for the learning part, we have learned some popular models by statisticians, by especially identity models, and we have learned some state-of-the-art algorithms for tackling these two types of models. And for the recitation, we just learned this maximum expected information uh, gain idea. Uh, whether or not it works nicely, that depends on the application. For the decision part, uh, we have uh, learned physical decision theory very quickly, and uh, also fairness conditions even more quickly, and some new mechanisms either designed by hand or hopefully designed by this automated framework. So about future work, uh, we have used Opera.io, uh, developed by a group of undergrad students, and uh, we have already used it in the coding for the Grand Marshall Week at RPI. It's a very serious event. It's actually um, it's even a holiday because of, um, it's election day for student government, choosing the spiritual um, um, leader of the union, uh, called Grand Marshall, but the actual leader is the president of the union. Anyway, so it's been uh, 150 years, and very big events. And we're having a uh, polling website, and this year we are kind of putting towards um, and, and just replacing the current framework by Opera. Uh, and uh, of course, this is just development, as you've already seen what is Opera, right? So you've seen the outcomes, you've seen some mixture models, um, but is there any interesting and exciting research can be done? I would say yes, because you probably didn't realize that if you use the two column, this is, um, there's a, um, um, Recommender system running in the back end. Why? Because, think about it. So I, I probably didn't say, sorry. Um, if this is your ranking, if I can guess your ranking correctly, you just need to click one move off button. I didn't say that, I'm sorry. You click one move off button, you click submit. That's very easy. You don't need to like, click this, 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 this. Uh, there is a user interface design, so we have a couple of, of, of um, user interfaces for you to submit all kinds of rank rankings. And uh, there is a, a learning and elicitation also happens here. Previously, we were thinking about dynamically changing the order, but it's, it's too distracting. So, uh, but anyway, so it's ongoing work. And you've already seen this learning part uh, of learning mixture models and presenting hopefully sensible information, uh, which can be a good summary of the agent's preference, which is very important, especially in business setting, because nobody wants to know, like, uh, um, uh, 20 uh, parameters summarizing the discussion. So it would be great if you can just tell them there are two groups of people. 70% thinks competitors is great. 
the other seventy percent thinks um, different is correct. Oh, by the way, this is not uh, for, uh, for for this audience. This is uh, the, the screenshot I got from another place. So, um, so making sense of the information is very important. Also, about the group decision making part, uh, there's a bunch of voting rules, very nice competition problems, uh, kind of beyond the whole field of competition and social choice. And I uh, also have algorithms for computing the marginal picture, which is kind of evaluate the you know, consensus in agents' preferences, um, saying that it's a minimal number of votes in order to change, so that we could change the outcome. So the largest number is means that um, more people have um, kind of, um, consensus, the more consensus we have. So far. Okay, so for the future work, um, I would say the take home message is that this is not a new problem. This is an old and everlasting problem. Um, the first voting rule, uh, this thing was designed in 2000 uh, years ago by, was that Aristotle or uh, Plato? Or, uh, yeah, it should be Plato. So, in one of Plato's work. So, um, and many statisticians, um, economists, computer scientists have tackled this problem. But we really think that uh, we've seen many new recent progress in this field and many applications uh, of, of, of the methodologies and, uh, of, uh, and so on. So for the learning part, uh, how can we uh, build better models? How can we build um, um, better algorithms? And especially, how can we use deep learning to uh, kind of refine um, the, the, uh, the fact use model, for example? And how can we use deep learning to refine um, uh, not just regression or, or, um, or probably regression? So uh, that, that's one of the problems. And uh, for the decision-making part, in addition to the fairness condition, how can we take into account ethical decisions, right? So um, there's been very hot discussions recently, uh, ethical AI, how can you make an ethical decision? Um, whatever it means, I'm sure there must be some mathematical definitions and some quantifiable ways uh, coming up in the future, and how can we take that into account when we design a good mechanism? And in particular, how can we design application-specific mechanism? So give me, return me, I, uh, this is a critical application. I think the mechanism must be very ethical, must be very fair. I don't care that much about um, accuracy. I don't care that much about speed, but I really value ethical, um, so ethics. So that's um, the, the, the kind of the, the framework I'm also building. Um, and there's a system building opera, but I can imagine that there are many other systems, like Penix by um, the group of uh, Felix Brand at the University of Munich. And uh, there's also a rubber boat by uh, our professor at BMU and his former student, um, Mr. Shah, uh, now a um, senior professor at University of Toronto, and many other systems, I'm sure. So, um, two announcements before I end the talk. One is that um, this is actually an interesting event of our community, Computing Social Choice. Um, next year will be uh, to RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, just search for RPI, you know where it is. Um, I will be one of course, co co chaired with uh, Edith Alkine from. Uh, Oxford, and the other one is that I have a two-year postdoc position on decision making. So, if any of those candidates, please uh, let me know uh, from next year. Uh, that's pretty much. Uh, thank you, and we thank NSF and ORN for.